Friends in Christ, you might remember a couple of years ago, our Holy Father, Pope Francis, issued a motu proprio on the Vatican's secret archives. And so recognizing that that word secret, when it was designated as the description for the archives centuries and centuries ago, has changed in its contemporary context. What we know and understand by secret, especially in these days, has changed significantly. Recognizing that the archives are accessible to anybody that wants to do serious study, anybody with a decent reason can enter the Vatican archives to do study and research. Recognizing all those things that have been so for centuries, our Holy Father Pope Francis changed the name from the Vatican secret archives to the Vatican apostolic archives. And so the point is clear, the church has nothing to hide. The treasures the church has received from Christ, she gladly discloses. She gladly passes on and makes known in the world that we live in. And so is the nature of God. You know, the Catechism of the Catholic Church says that God himself has an innermost secret. The God within himself holds a secret. The Catechism says that sending forth his only begotten Son, and the spirit of love in the fullness of time, God has revealed his innermost secret. And what is that innermost secret? The Catechism says it's that God is an eternal exchange of love, and he has now destined us to share in that exchange. In other words, we could never know what God is like St. Thomas Aquinas gives us the proofs for the existence of God, the argument by design, the argument of the prime mover, all these famous arguments of Thomas Aquinas for the existence of God, but we can never know what God is like in himself except for God were to reveal it. And so it is that he has sent his only begotten Son and the Spirit of love in the fullness of time to reveal this innermost secret, that he is an eternal exchange of love, and he has now destined us to share in that exchange. I would suggest this morning that that secret remains a secret for many people in the world today, that it remains something hidden, particularly for those who suffer, for those who go through trials and anguish, and difficulties, and doubts, and fears. It's very much hidden from them, oftentimes, that God loves them, that he wants them to share in this eternal exchange of his love that has been happening in the world around us, in particular when the church herself suffers. You know, there are parts of the world where you can be killed for being a Christian, parts of Africa, parts of the Middle East, the Nineveh Plain, which was once replete with Christian souls, is now almost annihilated of the Christian faith. It's a tragic parts of the world where the church is persecuted. And it's very difficult for us to see in those circumstances that God is an eternal exchange of love, that he has destined us to share in that exchange of love. And so it is with the apocalyptic literature that we hear about in the first reading and in the gospel this weekend, the book of Daniel and the gospel of St. Mark. And so that word apocalypse, it's not a negative word. It doesn't mean catastrophe. It doesn't mean a disaster. It means an unveiling. It means to lift the veil, literally. Apocalypse means to lift the veil. The book of the apocalypse of St. John the last book of the Bible, is translated into Latin, revelatio. It's a revealing, a revelation of what God is doing. Not a hiding back, but a revealing of the God who's present. And one of the characteristics of apocalyptic literature is that it's often given during the time of trial. It's during the, the great anguish of the Jewish people under the reign of terror of Antiochus IV, that the context of the book of Daniel comes to us. 
God says to Daniel the prophet, it will be a time unsurpassed in distress. But one of the other characteristics of apocalyptic literature is that it shows the great battle between good and evil and the great hope, the great hope that we have that God is present, that he'll bring us through the trial, that he'll be with us in the struggle and bring us home to safety. Daniel is told, at that time, your people will escape all of those who are written in the book of life. And so it is also in the gospel. Jesus is talking about a cataclysmic time. He has just foretold the destruction of the temple, that not one stone will be left upon another stone. That's the passage just preceding the passage that we listened to in the gospel this weekend. That would have been the world as they knew it. The temple is where they offer the daily sacrifice to the Lord. It was the dwelling place of God among his people. It was unthinkable that the temple itself could be destroyed. Yet Jesus says that this generation will not pass away until all these words have taken place that I share with you. And so it is in 70 AD, 40 years from the moment Christ is speaking, that the temple is destroyed and the city of Jerusalem is destroyed and left in ruins. More than that, Jesus says the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give off its light, and stars will be falling from the sky. Even the luminaries by which we're guided by are not stable. The world we live in will come to an end, Jesus is saying. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass away. And within that generation, something would happen that would be more cataclysmic, more catastrophic, and more glorious than anything that had preceded it or anything that would come after. It's in that period, in this generation, which Jesus is speaking to, that the Son of God will suffer and die on the cross. This is the great revelatio, the great revelation of who God is. In the Gospel of St. John, Jesus says, when the Son of Man is lifted up from the earth, he will draw all men to himself. He'll draw all humanity to himself. This is the great revelation of the God of love who dies offering himself in love for the forgiveness of sins. And that's the one sacrifice that's being talked about in the second reading for this weekend in the letter to the Hebrews. We hear in the letter to the Hebrews, every priest stands offering sacrifices day after day that can never take away sins. But this one, says the letter to the Hebrews, this one offered one sacrifice for sins and took his seat forever at the right hand of God. Now he waits until his enemies are made his footstool. That Christ has conquered evil and that offering of himself on the cross, but he has now destined you and I to share in that exchange of love that he lovingly offers himself, his body and his blood to his heavenly father in obedience of love for the forgiveness of the sins of the world. But he allows us to participate in that sacrifice when we unite ourselves to him at this altar. We unite ourselves to the offering of the body and blood of Christ and offer that perfect sacrifice of God. We are destined to share in that great exchange of love. And so, my friends in Christ, we can ask ourselves this morning, where is the church suffering the most in the world today? Where are you and I undergoing trials, difficulties, challenges, doubts, and fears? It's in that very place that Christ comes to us in a revelatio, an apocalypse, a revelation, to make known his love, to make known his mercy, to make known his goodness in our own hearts in our own world, in our own lives. We unite ourselves to the blessed sacrament of the Eucharist, knowing that God sending forth his Son and the spirit of love in the fullness of time has revealed his innermost secret, that God is an eternal exchange of love and that he has destined you and I to share in that exchange.